It's just after midnight at the bottom of the world. The expedition cruise ship MS Explorer is sailing through an ice field on its way to an Antarctic island. The 154 people on board don't know it yet, but in just a few minutes, their bucket list trip of a lifetime will come to a screeching halt, and they will all be forced to abandon ship in one of the most hostile environments on Earth. The resulting disaster was no less than an astonishing sight of a cruise ship capsizing in the ice, the photos of which were widely shared across the internet and found in books that I recall from my childhood. But the full story is sparsely told, and for how rare it is for a cruise ship to sink, the acts of heroism and sheer luck everyone on board experienced that night is truly astonishing. Join me today as we break down what exactly happened here, and hear from a passenger who was on board that fateful night. This is the story of the MS Explorer. This video is brought to you by my second channel, Bright Sun Travels, my new platform for high quality travel reviews. Search it on YouTube or click the link in the description below. It's the mid-1960s, and accessibility to the harder-to-reach corners of our planet have long been a task only for the ultra-wealthy or very special and qualified people. Lars Erik Lindblad, a Swedish-American entrepreneur, wanted to change that. After spending years chartering Navy ships to bring tourists to Antarctica, in 1969 he commissioned the construction of his travel company's first purpose-built leisure ship. At 239 feet long and weighing in at just over 2,300 tons, the ship was very small, especially compared to the retrofitted cruise liners of the time. Even iconic ocean liners of the past, like the Olympic class, the Explorer is absolutely dwarfed by them. Regardless, this wasn't any regular retrofitted cruise ship or ocean liner of the time. This was the very first purpose-built expedition cruise ship ever, able to accommodate 104 passengers and 54 crew. It was also a capable vessel, able to sail into hard-to-reach ports and down narrow channels. But most important was her double bottom hull, a reinforced plate at the keel designed to withstand impacts from icebergs, a critical design choice which would allow the vessel to sail into Antarctica. The lack of size and structural integrity for the time didn't compromise in comfort though, as the Explorer featured a 100-seat theater, a 90-seat explorer's lounge, and a very well-appointed dining room. This, along with the wide open decks, open bridge policy, and aft swimming pool, made this a very luxurious adventure for her passengers. And as the vessel set sail, Lars Erik did exactly that with his new ship. The Lindblad Explorer set out for new adventures and opened up the chance for regular people to finally visit some of the most remote places on Earth. Through the 70s and into the 80s, he and his company continued to push the boundaries for the cruise industry, even sailing the Explorer through the notorious Northwest Passage. In fact, it was the first cruise ship to do so. These expeditions became quite popular for those who sought out adventure, and it really began a new and modern expedition industry. Other companies would also enter the market with their own purpose-built ships, notably and maybe infamously the World Discoverer, which would later meet a striking fate and as a ship I've talked about in an old Abandoned episode. But the Lindblad Explorer had proven herself as a reliable and versatile ship, not only sailing special trips through polar regions, but also cruises down the rivers into the Amazon. Nicknamed the Little Red Ship, most who sailed aboard the Explorer loved the comforts the vessel offered. Over the course of the next few years, the Explorer would change hands a few times, being renamed to the Society Explorer in 1985. This came with a few improvements to the superstructure, as well as the addition of modern Zodiacs at the top deck aft. This was all from the purchase and investment from a German expedition company called Society Expeditions, which also ironically owned the World Discoverer. In fact, both of these ships were sent through the Solomon Islands, though only the Explorer would return home. Finally though, after a few more acquisitions, the ship would be sold for a final time in 2004 to a Canadian leisure company called Gap Adventures. Like the many other companies that had owned her, Gap Adventures was focused around curated expeditions around the world. By now the vessel had been renamed to simply the MS Explorer, and at this point it was a well-traveled legend of a cruise ship 
having completed more than 250 trips to Antarctica. Gap performed some light renovations and sent the ship out on expeditions through the early 2000s, sailing her through the Panama Canal, the Amazon River, Chilean fjords, and the Canadian Arctic. But the most popular destination was Antarctica, and by November of 2007, the explorer was gearing up for a 19-day expedition cruise that would see it depart from Ushuaia, Argentina, heading west to the Falkland Islands, and on to South Georgia Island, and finally into Antarctic waters, where the vessel would make daily landings on the Antarctic Peninsula. The total cost for this bucket list trip would start at $15,000 based on double occupancy, all the way up to $29,000 for the suites. Gap Adventures named this trip the Spirit of Shackleton, a tribute to the explorer whose vessel famously got stuck in the ice and later sank. No matter though, as on November 11th, 2007, the MS Explorer left Ushuaia with 100 passengers and 54 crew on board. I mean, really, that's it's a place I'd been interested in going to see, but I didn't know that it was possible. So I heard before about like joining research expeditions or things like that as far as going. So I kind of thought it was something that was out of out of reach for me unless I found some job like that. And then it turns out that a, a company I had intended to do other travel with organized trips there and you could actually go as a tourist. So I was surprised to find that out. And then and then I ended up booking this trip. And this is my first time being with a, a like-minded group of people. So this was not luxury travel. So this was really an expedition explorer type type of thing. And it felt that way. And that was my first time being surrounded by people who had the same kind of mindset. By day 12, the ship was sailing towards the Antarctic Peninsula, intending to make landfall on the mainland the next day. At the helm was 49-year-old Captain Benget Wimmen, an experienced master who had an extensive background with sailing in ice conditions after years on the bridge in the Baltic Sea. The officers on board knew that his experience would come in handy, as thick sea ice had formed around the peninsula, essentially impossible to pass through for such a small ship. This forced an itinerary change, which is common for these types of experiences, as no voyage to Antarctica will ever be the same. So instead, the captain charts a course for the next best thing, picking an island in the South Shetland Islands, around 100 kilometers from mainland Antarctica. So far on this trip, the ship had yet to transit an actual ice field, avoiding them for the spotty ice and open waters. As the sun began to set on November 22nd, the ship entered an ice patch, cruising at around 5 knots. By nightfall, visibility was limited, the ice in front of them only illuminated by the forward-mounted searchlights. While this ice field was pretty large, by 10 p.m., the captain didn't seem to be alarmed by the lack of visibility, stating to his officers that the field they were plowing through was thought to be first-year ice, or thin enough ice for the ship to safely pass through. This, however, was a fatal mistake. As the ship progressed through the field, the captain could see open water just beyond what looked like a denser ridge of ice. It was approaching midnight, and as the ship began picking up speed to gouge their way through the ice, a large shudder and bang reverberated through the vessel as the explorer came to an abrupt stop. Indeed, the ice was thicker than anticipated and had caused the ship to get hung up on it. We had a, a captain's briefing about where we were heading and what was coming up and we were told that it was going to be a noisy night because we we're going to be going through an ice field and i decided for the first time that night to wear some earplugs the ice is banging along the side of the ship and then there was a, a bigger bang so the captain per his training backed the vessel up and rammed it again until the ship made progress. What they didn't know, however, was that during this, a long stretch of the hull had been breached open. And while I was laying there, a little while later, I started hearing the sound of running water. I ripped out my earplugs, I go to turn on, we have reading lights by our bed, and the reading light won't turn on, but I touch the wall and I feel water coursing down the wall in my cab and over my hand. We had another roommate on the other side of the cabin, so it was a triple cabin, but he also had a switch by his bed that was a master control that could turn on the lights for the whole room. And he turned that on and we saw that already our cabin was flooded with, with over a foot of water. I felt it was serious. I felt like 
you know, I saw the ship was filling up quickly. I was sure we were going to have to abandon ship. Eli's room on 300 deck in cabin 314 was the first to report the damage. His cabin was mostly below the waterline, and somewhere behind his wall, a steady stream of cold sea ice was pouring in. It wasn't until Eli's alarm that the bridge was actually made aware that something was wrong. Crew and officers quickly made their way down to 300 deck to discover a large amount of water accumulating in the hallway and in the passenger cabin. While it was initially thought to be a small hole open in just one cabin, the rate of water overtaking the small pumps had confirmed the crew's worst fears. After personally assessing the damage and the rapid influx of water, Captain Weeman declared an abandoned ship order for all passengers and crew. By now, the ship was out of the ice field, but because of the influx of water, the explorer was listening. All 154 people on board were in a quickly deteriorating situation, and at least 46 kilometers from the nearest land. The bridge was able to make contact with two nearby cruise ships, the National Geographic Endeavour and the Nord Norge. Both of them, however, were several hours away. As the explorer was also making contact with the Chilean and Argentinian navies, there was a major issue looming below. Water was now seeping into the separator room, a section where some critical machinery like the OWS are situated, basically a system that pumps oil to the generators. As water filled this room, however, the machinery shorted out, and by 2 a.m., the explorer had lost all power and thrust. The wind was now pushing the vessel back into the ice field, and launching lifeboats into shifting ice would be extremely dangerous. Chief Engineer Yervi Pavlovsky worked quickly to make a sort of makeshift pump that would allow him to manually pump oil into the generators and restore power. With the engines back online, the crew and passengers began their evacuation. While some confusion ensued over the next hour or so, nearly all passengers and crew boarded the explorer's four lifeboats and were lowered into the icy water. Members of the expedition team, meanwhile, began launching the inflatable Zodiacs, turning the expedition pleasure craft into tugboats for the 152 people now on the open ocean. The captain and a member of the expedition team remained on board, attempting to get the vessel's systems back online and steer the vessel into safety. He was still under the impression that the ship wouldn't fully sink. By this point, however, a significant amount of water had seeped into the engine room. And without the engineers to manage the systems below the waterline, the engines were now malfunctioning. On the bridge, the captain had little to no control over the rudder or power to the propeller. The ship was basically out of control, running full astern, moving at around 8 knots in circles. Any hope to save the explorer was lost by this point, and despite the captain pressing the emergency stoppage button on the helm, there was just no response from the engine. So the last two people aboard disembarked the out-of-control cruise ship via Zodiac, and the explorer was left sailing adrift. So too were the passengers and crew, huddled together on four open-air lifeboats. The air was frigid, and the seas were rough, the little boats barely handling the large swells. Most passengers and crew didn't even find the onboard safety kits filled with seasickness tablets and emergency blankets for up to an hour at sea. I don't know if we were overcrowded as far as the official capacity, but the lifeboat was packed. There wasn't room to move on it. This wasn't these, it wasn't a covered lifeboat. So being off the coast of Antarctica in a, in a rowboat is not the way you want to be. There wasn't anyone taking charge. I don't know what was going on on the back of my lifeboat. Um, but the crew member at the front was just huddled down beneath the edge of the boat anyway. And he was obviously scared. And it was freezing cold, so when they went to drag us using the Zodiac sprays coming on us, there was a bit of sleet and rain that, that fell on us, and it was freezing. I was freezing. Ultimately, the 154 people aboard the lifeboats bobbed around on the open ocean for around four hours. Finally, though, one of the cruise ships that had been contacted earlier that morning had arrived. It was the MS Nord Norge, which quickly sent down lifeboats and began ferrying passengers from the explorer's vintage boats on board the ship. Soon after that, 
the National Geographic Endeavor had also arrived on scene. Astonishingly, all 154 people who were on board the MS Explorer had been safely brought on board the Nord Norge. And as they sailed by the Explorer one last time to salute the stricken ship, they made way for King George Island just as a gale was starting to pick up. There, the Explorer's passengers would disembark and be evacuated by air back to South America. As the rescue cruise ships left the scene, the winds began picking up, and the now powerless, abandoned ship had drifted back into the ice field. While the Explorer was designed with watertight compartments, the ship could stay afloat if only one was breached. The reality of the situation, though, was that once water began penetrating hold 4, the water then made its way down into the deck below, the engine room. The watertight doors between the separator oil pump room and the generator room was apparently leaking. From that point, both compartments in the engine room had been compromised, and water would have then flooded the onboard sewage tanks, which would have caused water to stream back up the pipes and overflow the toilets and sinks in the cabins above. We saw a similar situation with the Oceanos, where water had been forced back up into the cabins, which ultimately caused an extreme list and eventual sinking. The same situation was happening here, as water was being sent up above the waterline, making the ship very top-heavy and causing a huge list. The crew on the Explorer were only using two portable pumps, as well as the internal bilge pump, to drain the water out. And while initially it seemed as though they were making progress, there was really no chance at keeping the flooding at a controllable rate. Once the water started streaming through the cabins, it would be free to fill other compartments and eventually take the whole ship down though at a very slow rate. By 3.30pm on November 23rd, 2007, the water had reached a critical point on the saloon deck, and the Explorer began to roll over on her starboard side. The rate of flooding then accelerated as the ship likely capsized and slipped beneath the icy waters above, around 14 hours since the collision happened. These were the last photos taken from the site, and it doesn't seem like anyone was actually there to witness the final moments for the ship. Explorer had been sailing the seas for 37 years, only to meet an abrupt and sad end in the environment she was designed for. The final report for the disaster puts the initial blame mostly on the captain. He was experienced navigating through ice, but mainly in the Baltic Sea, where the ice is often very thin. He mistook the field the explorer had been traveling through as first year ice, when in reality it was much thicker and posed a serious threat to the vulnerable hull. He was also likely moving too fast through the ice field, and the danger was compounded by the fact that it was nighttime. But once the damage was done, the crew were praised for their swift and professional actions. In fact, the report notes several instances where the chances of death were extremely high if it were not for certain heroic acts and just sheer luck. If the ship had remained powerless and the wind drifted the ship back into the field, launching into the ice would have been nearly impossible. It also meant they wouldn't have power to the cranes that would be necessary to launch the Zodiacs. The chief engineer is really a hero for his ingenuity and quick thinking. But really, if the captain had decided to delay the evacuation instead of mustering all the passengers out of precaution, the list of the vessel would have likely prevented the portside lifeboats from being launched trapping at least half on board the ship. If the rescue cruise ships took slightly longer to reach the site, and those gale force winds moved in, it would have been very likely that many of the passengers in the open air lifeboats would have succumbed to hyperthermia. With those scenarios and many more in mind, it's truly astonishing and really a miracle that everyone had been saved. We were very lucky with the rescue. I mean, I didn't think I was going to make it. I thought that was that was it. From at the beginning, you know, going, I just thought this is what we need to do. I'd felt for a while that we would need to abandon ship. Um, but when we were out there and I was freezing and I couldn't feel my feet anymore, uh, yeah, it looked like the end to me. So I'm very glad to be rescued and still be here. But people would ask, oh, how does this change how you think or something like that or your perspective? You know, when they were asking that right after we're rescued, it's like, yeah, I'm not sure, not sure what to say to that question. But when I got home, it was very clear. 
you see people so caught up in their day-to-day -day problems and a lot of it's just little inconveniences on the road or at a grocery store or with I don't know in other situations it's not it's not something to be so consumed by as for the ship itself, well, the MS Explorer was truly a trailblazer. It was the first of its kind and helped pave the way for the entire sub-industry of expedition ship travel. For those who sailed on her throughout the nearly 40 years she lived, the Explorer was truly that. A passenger ship that could go nearly anywhere and bring like-minded, average people to new and exotic places all in comfort. For that reason, many adored the vessel, and for decades, it was revered as an icon of the oceans. But at the same time, it was an aging ship, and by 2007, modern expedition cruise ships were already traversing the same waters that at one time, only the explorer could. So it was a matter of time before the vessel was scrapped. Maybe then, it was fitting that the explorer took her final plunge in the waters she was designed to sail. There is a weirdly peaceful thought that the shipwreck will likely never be discovered again, and the explorer will forever be entombed below the icy waters. While the wreck was found in 2008 by the Royal Navy at a depth of 3,700 feet, it's unlikely that it will ever be explored thereafter. Today, the expedition cruise market has grown exponentially, with several new cruise lines starting up in recent years, and new, ultra-luxurious, purpose-built ships now sailing the waters. In all honesty, they look pretty spectacular, especially a few of them, and the opportunities they afford regular people, at least those who are going to fork over the cash, all of these new ships open up the less traveled parts of the planet and give people the opportunity to see them. There's even a voyage to go see the wreck of the world discoverer. But as this industry evolves and likely gets larger and hopefully safer, we'll have to look back and remember where it all started with a little red ship. I have a brand new YouTube channel called Bright Sun Travels. It's a place where I put together high quality and thorough reviews on all types of experiences, from Virgin Voyages new cruise ships to a castle in Banff. And who knows, maybe even an Antarctic expedition. I unironically really do want to try out Vikings expedition ships very bad. But if you instead want to watch me potentially suffer, I also have a voyage coming up aboard the Margaritaville Paradise. So if that's something you're interested in, subscribe to the new channel, search Bright Sun Travels on YouTube, or click the link in the description below. Of course, if you also like these types of videos, subscribe here on Bright Sun Films, too. I also want to give a special thanks to Mike from Ocean Liner Designs and his team for dreaming up the animated visuals in this video. A link to his channel will also be in the description below. Anyway guys, my name is Jake, and thank you very much for watching. Tossing, tossing